So uh, over to you, uh, John. Uh, Nest for Chris, princess, mistress, mother. Right, Philip, thank you. Um, I, we've run a little, do I still have my 40 minutes? Yeah, you yeah, well, yeah you've got 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, now, Melissa, you may not have done that intentionally. I presume you did, but uh, the the specific uh, case you talked about amongst the Welsh and the Normans fighting against a Flemish or, uh, or 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 defending against a Flemish happened to be the sons and nephews of my protagonist or our protagonist today, uh, Nest, um, and that was Wiesel's castle. And it is a very confusing episode, and uh, and uh, and one that is difficult to pin down. As are there, there are also very many others. Now, um, I would normally be quite concerned about speaking as the, the uh, on the last uh, as the last speaker, but uh, as Philip has already said, when you have lots of sex and violence involved in your talk, you know you can probably hold an audience. I do promise you don't need to switch for the off button. I will try to keep it to an R rating at the very uh, at the very worst. Um, so, who was Nest? If you ne if you Google Nest, you you see all kinds of stories. There are books written about her because she is an extremely interesting character. Um, I've decided to pick one of the more uh, interesting images that portrays Nest. Uh, this is some sort of an Asian warrior uh, look that she had, that somebody ascribed to her. She was neither Asian nor was she a warrior, although her, um, her aunt was a warrior, a very famous uh, warrior, Gwen Lian. Uh, but she herself, she was uh, a princess very first, and we'll, we'll go through that. But more importantly, uh, we don't know a lot about her except for a few of the um, references in, in the Chronicles. But what we do know is a lot about the people she kept company with. And from that, we can put together a bit of her life story and perhaps even most importantly, the legacy of her children uh, lives on and lived on. And, um, and they would, they would, they would uh, uh, define, define her, her legacy in, in many, many ways. Um, I've broken the talk into three bits, Princess Mistress Mother, she was clearly much more multifaceted than that. And I, I, I do apologize to her for, for being so simple, but it does give us a reason, a, an outline of, um, uh, of, of, of her life. And, I, and we can use that as a guide. Um, first of all, she was the princess of Dehaboth, uh, which, so it's very important that you understand where that is. Here it is in the Southwest of, um, let's see, where are we? Uh, there we go. In Southwest Wales, the uh, Hayboth made of Duffet, Astratawi, Keredigion from various parts. Um, she was from this area. Uh, what, is, what is important about this map is that the Hayboth, as you can see, as, a, as opposed to Powys, uh, did not have to deal with the Normans uh, initially. Uh, when William the Conqueror came for various reasons, and it's explained very well in Philip's, in Philip's book, they did, uh, Philip William the Conqueror did not uh, invade Wales right away, but he established three earldoms on the border of Hereford, Shrewsbury, and Chester. Uh, and he, he set those up shortly after, um, after the conquest and it stayed that way for some time. Um, however, it was not long before the enterprising Normans began to push into Wales, particularly in the North. And I got a bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, they don't stay where they were and they do get very involved in the Haybarth uh, later on. So who were Ness's parents? Well, her, her father was Rhys Up Tudor. And Rhys was a descendant of Hal Thaw and Hal Thaw was the lawgiver and any anybody who was descended from Halfa had a legitimate claim to the throne. In other words, very strong pedigree. Uh, what was interesting about Rhysop Tudor was he was he was he was none of his his father grandfather none of them were rulers of the Haybarth because they all had older brothers. But during the violent 11th century, all his all, all his cousins from elder brothers all were either killed, castrated, or just disappear and leaves him almost last man standing. Now. That, that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to become ruler. You have to have the strength and the charisma to pull it off. And he did. So he claimed himself as ruler in, in, the, in, in around 1080. Um, he was married to Galadis Fer Ruwalen Ap Kunfen. I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna say that again. I apologize to the Welsh in the audience. And, um, and she was the daughter, as you can see, of Ruwalen. He was leader of Powys and a very, and very senior. So, so uh, Nest has some real pedigree here and, and very much, very strong Welsh royal blood. Um, in 1080, as I said, he was the last man standing at the Hayboth. Um, in 1081, he allied with, with, um, with uh, Griffith, uh, Griffith of Cunnan of Gwyneth, 
against a, uh, an invasion, if you will. Uh, it was a challenge to his rule by one of the southeastern uh, Welsh rulers and two other rulers from Gwynedd. They are victorious. Uh, the, the challengers are killed. And interestingly enough, in 1081, right after that battle, uh, William the Conqueror pays a visit to St. David's, of which you can see a picture, although it didn't look anything like that in 1081, uh, you can see a picture of that on, on, on the phone, thanks to our, our very own Philip Hugh who took that. Um, anyway, Re William comes to, uh, to Southwest Wales, appoints Rhys Gisicar and, and makes him his man uh, uh, to, uh, in, in, in Wales, uh, in Southwest Wales. In fact, this is even uh, documented in the Doomsday Book um, in that he has to pay I believe it's 40 pounds a year tribute to William for his, uh, for his duties. Um, Griffith, who is, who is his co-victor, was not quite so uh, successful. He, um, he is taken prisoner by uh, the Earl of Chester and kept in prison for 13 years. In any case, while William is king, uh, the only challenge to Rhys is, uh, is from other Welsh rulers, which he has to fight off over time, but he, stays, he successfully stays in control of the Haybar. And it is around this time that Nest is born. They suggest around 1085, although we can't know for sure. Um, William dies, William the Conqueror dies in 1087. He died in 1087, excuse me. And the agreement in the Southwest was still being honored by the new king, which was William's son, William Rufus. But William suffered a, uh, there was an ins insurrection against him in 1088. Uh, his baronage was, um, the barony was becoming more and more, uh, greedy, seeking, uh, seeking more patronage, and William began to relent, and you began to see more and more pressure build in Wales. One of the uh, key uh, Norman barons doing this was a Bernard of Neufmarche, who steadily progressed up the Wye Valley, and when it came to the fact, and when it came to him building a castle at Brecon, uh, Rhys was forced into action. Uh, he, he, he went to, uh, to meet him, uh, Rhys fell in battle, and I, to give you an idea of Reese's importance and what's, and, and what's happened uh, afterwards, I'm going to quote from the Brit, and that is, 1093 was the year of Christ when Reese of Tudor, king of the Habarth, was slain by the French, who were in Happen Brekinjog, Brecon, and then fell the kingdom of the Britons. Quite dramatic stuff. And it may be, it might be slightly an over-exaggeration, but in 1093, after the fall of Reese, this is basically what happened. Uh, the, the top, the top uh, invade, that had, that had been going on already. But in 1093, the Montgomery family, who'd been establishing their way up the Severn Valley, they moved down and built a castle at Cardigan, then another castle at Pembroke. There's a seaborne, royally sponsored invasion that builds a castle at Rita Gos, uh, near present day Carmarthen. And, uh, and, 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 Basically, the Normans were pushed out, uh, excuse me, the Welsh were pushed out in 1093, and these castles were built. Um, what, what happens to Nest at this time is very unclear. It is assumed that she is uh, taken away to England somewhere where she is raised by a noble family. We do know what happens to her brother, though, who was too young to be ruler. He knew he was in danger, or his family knew he was in danger, and her brother Griffith was sent to Ireland uh, in exile for his own safety. Before coming back to Nest, I would like to look at somebody who's going to become her future husband, and that's Gerald of Windsor. He, he appears, he begins to appear in the Chronicle in the Brit in the 1090s. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, to look uh, at what, what was actually going on here. Now, in 1094, the Welsh struck back and destroyed as the Brit says, destroyed all the castles the French had built, apart from Pembroke and Urida Gorse, the two that I've mentioned. Um, Gerald of Windsor had been appointed by the Montgomery family, namely uh, Arnulf of Montgomery, the, the younger son, as its, as its castellan, and he was holding out for them. Um, it was, uh, South Wales at this time was obviously a place for advancement. Both Gerald and Arnulf were, were younger sons, and they were, if you will, frontiersmen, but they they were they were holding out. Um, it was also not unusual for the for the note for the uh, the Norman nobleman not to be there and to have appointed a, a castle or steward. In this case, that was Gerald of Windsor. Um, what then happens in 1096? We only find out later uh, through the writings of Gerald of Windsor 
But in 1097, there's an interesting quote in the Brit, which um, uh, says that then the lands of St. David's, along these, I'm paraphrasing, the lands of St. David's were uh, ravaged by Gerald the Steward. So on its own, you would think that's not very unusual. Um, the Brit at this time is, is full of accounts of French ravaging uh, parts of Wales, Welsh destroying all the castles of the Brits. And it was an extremely violent period uh, that was, was coming and flowing. But um, what we get is an account much, much later uh, from Gerald of, we uh, Gerald of Wales, who's the grandson of Nest. And he, he, he describes that in 1096, the fighting men of Powys besieged Pembroke Castle. 15 of the fighting men uh, decided it, they'd seen enough and they snuck off They snuck off by boat, leaving Gerald with just these, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the armors that were looking after these knights. Gerald had them all don their own armor, uh, don their knight's armor, promoted them all to knight and made it look as if they were still garrisoning the castle. Um, they then had their last hog cut up into pieces and thrown over the walls to give the impression they had plenty of food. And then a letter was composed to Arnold of Montgomery by Gerald saying that they were in good position and wouldn't need any relief for another four months. This letter was kept, uh, was uh, discreetly left somewhere near the Bishop of St. David's outside of his quarters. Of course, that letter finds the way into, into his hands and that letter gets to the Welsh procedures. He decides they've seen enough they take all their spoils and plunder and they go away. Pembroke, state, Pembroke survived. It was the only castle at the end of the 12th century, still in Norman hands in this part of Wales. And it is interesting to think what may have happened had that castle fallen. Probably would have only delayed the inevitable, but we, we will never know. What, um, what is clear though, is that, uh, that Gerald was a very uh, enterprising man and he was a, uh, and if uh, you have to be a little bit careful, obviously, because Gerald of Wales, obviously, obviously he exaggerated a lot about his own family and, and this would have been his grandfather. Uh, but nevertheless, you get an idea that uh, even if this is pure exaggeration, the fact that it was in, 19, in 1096 and uh, that there is a, a, a line in the Brit that he ravages the lands of St. David's in 1097 would indicate very much that there's, very, there's something, uh, there's some uh, shreds of truth uh, to this story. Anyway, back to Nest. Um, here's another example of uh, the mythology that surrounds Nest. Um, she, she some, at some point, she finds her way to the royal court of William Rupus, it's, it seems. Um, and there she catches the eye of, of the future king, Henry I. Um, this image here is often portrayed as those two um, wearing their crowns uh, in a liaison. Uh, it is in fact, and this is thanks to some great detective work by our own Kirsten Lawton Smith, this is in fact an Arthurian legend and has nothing to do with uh, Nest and Henry, but it's a great picture and is often used and therefore I've decided to use it myself. But at some stage she has, a, a, she has an affair with, um, with Henry and this produces a child, another Henry. And it, it, uh, it was not unusual or nor was it, um, uh, a necessarily a bad thing to have a child for such a highborn person. In fact, uh, in these days, those days, illegitimate children can often be very well looked after. Uh, Henry's eldest illegitimate son, a Robert, Robert of Gloucester, actually becomes er, became Earl of uh, Earl of Gloucester, and was a key figure in the uh, Civil War uh, uh, after the death of Henry the First. And Henry himself, as I'll, as I'll talk about a bit later, this is uh, the, the the son of Nest. He actually ends up with some very senior positions and uh, and, and 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 plays a large role. Um, as we get towards the end of the uh, sorry, um, in eleven hundred, uh, William Rufus is killed in a hunting accident, and Henry the first Henry becomes Henry the first of England. So now, if if she had had this child with Henry uh, before, now this is a child of a king, and and that's very significant. Um, once he becomes king, first thing Henry has to do um, is he, re he, he removes anyone he thinks might be a threat to him. And one of those threats is the Montgomery family. And as I said before, the Montgomerys were the ones that swept down and built Pembroke Castle, put it in the hands of Arnulf and left it with Gerald. Once, they, once he's removed the Montgomery family from their holding, he basically has them exiled back to France. He takes Pembroke into his own hands 
and there's a no noticeable uh, change in strategy there. Um, as we get into the middle, uh, it, it, about 1107, 1108, there's a mass influx of Flemish settlers, which almost push all the Welsh out of southwest, uh, out of a corner of southwest Wales, very near Pembroke. Um, he built a royal castle at Carmarthen, and that would become another center of royal power in the south. And for this period, basically 1100 to his death in 1135, Norman, Norman power in the region is, is almost uh, uncontested. There are some, uh, some events that arise and we'll talk about one of those obviously in just a minute. It's one of the major ones. But overall, this was a great time to be a, um, a Norman in, in Southwest Wales and royal sponsor. He was, he was such a powerful king that the Welsh never really uh, fought back during his reign. Um, sorry. Now we get to the, uh, now we get to the good part. Um, Gerald, had been re was removed as castellan of Pembroke early in Henry's reign. He was probably seen as a bit too close to the Montgomery family. Um, he had actually been one of the envoys that was sent to Ireland to uh, arrange a marriage between Arnulf and an Irish king's daughter in exchange for military help. Uh, so already an early connection between Gerald and Ireland. Um, that, that, uh, that marriage did take place. Um, the, the help arrived too late to save Arnulf, and, uh, and nothing really came of it, but it did show that he was very close and Henry had him removed. However, in the Brit, uh, the person, he, he's, he's, it is actually mentioned uh, that Gerald is put back into his job in 1105, and he becomes Castellan of Pembroke. It is around this same time that Gerald and Ness were married. How they exactly met is still not clear. Uh, lots of theories that Gerald may have been back visiting uh, his father at Windsor Castle. Gerald came from Windsor. Like I said, he was a younger son. Nest, there, you, can, you can create, and there are many people have done it, you can create um, a story that, um, that, that puts Nest in Windsor around that time. However, it could just as easily be that she was, she was still in, in Southwest Wales and they met there. What's almost certain is, uh, given her position and his, and his position, this would have been sanctioned by Henry and it was certainly a, um, a, a stroke of genius on his part because she gave Gerald legitimacy. Their children were half Welsh nat naturally, which put them in a, in a different position when it came to getting, uh, getting um, appointments in, 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 in various places. So um, it, was a, uh, it, was, it was a strong move that solidified Gerald and the royal position in Southwest Wales. Um, the, the position, uh, the, um, the strength of the Norman hold over the Southwest um, also enticed Gerald to expand his own, um, his own prospects. He was never going to be Lord of Pembroke, but he, he moved north and built a castle near present-day Kilgarin in, in about 1108. It's, uh, he moved all his goods and his young family up there and, and established his own lordship. And this was, this was quite bold because he was very near Welsh-controlled territory. He built his castle, and he would have, uh, and uh, and and he would have known he was in a bit of a risky position, but probably didn't realize quite how risky. Because at Christmas, um, uh, the a Welshman by the name of Owen had heard that um, had heard that uh, Ness was nearby. He'd known her because they were they were they were second cousins removed, once removed, I believe, and uh, he would have she knew that he was there, and he was he was smitten with her. In any case, I will read directly from the footage. Um, about what happened at Christmas in 1109 at Kenarth Bucking Castle. And after that, at the instigation of God, he, Owain, came of a night to the castle and but a few men with him, about 14, after having secretly made a hole under the threshold unknown to the keepers of the castle. And he, then he came to the chamber in which Gerald and Ness, his wife, were sleeping. And they raised a shout around and about the chamber in which Gerald was and kindled tapers and set fire to the buildings to burn them. And when he heard the shout, Gerald awoke, not knowing what to do. And then Ness said to him, go not out the door, for there thine enemies await thee, but follow me. And that he did. And she led him to the privy, which had joined the chamber. And there, as is said, he escaped by way of the privy hole. And when Ness knew that he'd escaped, she cried out from within and said to the men who were outside, why do you cry out in vain? Who whom you seek is not here. He has escaped. And after they had entered, they searched for him everywhere. 
And when they did not find him, they seized Nest and her two sons and her daughter and another son of his by a concubine, and they sacked and plundered the castle. And after burning the castle and collecting spoil and having intercourse with her, he returned to his land. Now, that's pretty graphic stuff for, for a historical chronicle. And it, uh, it, was a, it was a crime of passion that had big repercussions. I'm gonna address one thing first, and this is the, the there, there, are, there are still stories out there and, and it's, it, you don't, no one really knows for sure that, that Ness may have been complicit in this. But if you look a bit later in the passage, the, the reason they say she's complicit is because she stayed with Elwain for some time after this abduction. And, um, and it, so that, that, that the theory then went that she, um, that, she was, uh, that she was complicit. But very shortly in, in the Brit, uh, she says to Owain, if thou wouldest have me faithful to thee and keep me with thee, have my children escorted to their father. And in this, and in his infatuation and love for the woman, he really, excuse me, and in his infatuation and love for the woman, he released his two sons and daughter for the steward. So we, we see more a mother fighting to save her children. And then she was able, she was actually willing to, to stay with him to, to have her children released. So I'm not so sure if it's quite, um, if it's quite so clear that, uh, um, that, that she was complicit. In any case, this sets off a, um, a string of events. Um, this sets off a string of events that, that ultimately lead to the destruction of, of Owen's father. Owen becomes a fugitive. Uh, it, it's, it's unclear how long she stays with Owen because he, he becomes a fugitive. He has to flee to Ireland. Eventually, Owen is um, reconciled to Henry I, though, in about 1114. He even is knighted by Henry uh, and goes to France with him. So he makes a full comeback. Uh, but in 1116, while, while on King's business, he's spotted near Carmarthen Castle by, by some Flemish archers who are friendly to Gerald, and they, they pursue him and, and, and get their revenge and kill him. It's interesting that he doesn't even try to run away because he thinks that he's on King's business and therefore has seized no fear. But uh, the hatred ran so deep amongst Gerald's men that uh, they, they weren't going to let him get away. So anyway, after all that hot story, I decided we, we need to take a little breather here and, and take a little step back. I just want to show you um, where and how far away this castle was from where, where their, their power base was. So here's Pembroke Castle down here. And they built another castle here, Carew, for, for their own lordship. Um, Kenneth Buchan is here, and this is all Welsh con controlled territory. So this tells you quite a bit about the feeling that they were, they were secure enough under Henry the first, they felt they could go out there. I, it must be, must be noted that Camice was also under Norman control. The Martins were there and there were castles all through here. So it wasn't completely out there, but it was, it was a risky move and certainly uh, showed historically to be, uh, it was a risky move. Um, uh, and, and then, like I said, uh, it's important that, uh, that, uh, you, that, that this area, Kairu Castle, that becomes the son of one of the, um, the castle of one of the sons. So, right. So anyway, back to the story. Griffith of Brice, I'm going to mention, is um, Griffith of Brice, I'm going to mention because he's the brother of Nest. And he, 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 he it's important to understand him because it's his children that go on to rule the Haybar. A little bit like it's important to understand Ness because of what her children do. As I mentioned before, Griffith returned from exile sometime about before 1115. He'd been in exile in Ireland to save his own life. What's really interesting is the Brit says he stayed with Gerald, the husband of Ness. Doesn't mention he's staying with, with Ness as well. So Ness may still have been with Owen at that time, or she was maybe not around. It may not mean anything, but it is the wording is somewhat interesting. Um, stayed with Gerald from time to time even though he was considered an outlaw by Henry I, family ties ran deep. Uh, he does end up staging an uprising in 1116, which faltered on the castles of the Normans. It didn't really achieve very much. In fact, the Brit refers to it as a, as a bunch of hot, the, the rebels, or rebels, it's not a good thing. The, uh, the Welsh is a bunch of hot heads. Uh, he himself eventually gets reconciled to Henry I, and he settled in a small part of Wales in Northern Carmarthen. Um, when Henry died, he was about to become the leader of, a, of an uprising when he died, but his children, and one in particular, 
were very, very influential in the in the in the re reestablishment of the, the House of the Haboth. And uh, we won't have time to go through all that, but it's it's I'm going to show it now in our family tree, which is a little bit obscured by uh, by the talk there, but I can talk. It. So here's Resop Tudor, who died 1093, nest as a brother out, and here's Griffith. That story that Melissa told about the 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 um, the, the, uh, the Flemish castle that was under siege. These were Maurice, William, David. They were rumored to be uh, maybe not David, but those two were there. Cadell, Meredith, Reese, they were all there. And it's and the story goes, they were working together because the, there was a feud between the, the um the sons of Gerald and Nest, and uh and 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 they they actually recruited Welsh help. I, I agree, it's 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 a very difficult story. But what I, what this what this uh, family tree is, is showing you is that the key members of the house of the Haybarth are also our direct cousins of the the up and coming elite of Southwest Wales who are the sons of Gerald and Nest. It's, I, it couldn't fit all the uh, other children of Nest on there, but we will, uh, we will talk to them in, in, in talk to them in just a little bit. Um, but I, that, that's the main point of this. It's not just the Gerald and Nest and their sons, but it's also how close they are to the ruling Welsh dynasty. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the children of Nest. Um, according to Gerald of Wales, Nest had eight sons from different fathers, including Henry. Uh, three of the sons were with Gerald, um, and they were, they were a big part of the establishment uh, of, of Pembroke. Um, the eldest one became, Lord, became the Lord of Carew. Um, another one married the, the Lord of Manorbeer and was the mother of Gerald of Wales. Um, one became Bishop of St. David's, which is St. David's was the, the prime church in Wales. Uh, that was following uh, Henry I had placed a purely Norman bishop against the uh, the Welsh canon, so against the will of the Welsh canon, excuse me. Um, so David was somewhat of a compromise that he was half Norman and half um, and half Welsh. Uh, there was another element to it about whether uh, it should be a metropolitan see. In other words, whether the bishop of St. David's should be an archbishop. That gets way outside the scope of this talk, but it's uh, it's a very interesting uh, part of history. Um, and and these sons, as I said, they were they were stewards of St. David's. One became bishop of St. David's, and they and they all had um, one became the lord of Lanstephan, which is the is the castle you see there. That's Maurice, and um, and they keep popping up in the records in various strange places. And there's there's one example where the men of Tenby um, beat up. Cadell so badly, that's the that's one of the brothers, uh, so badly that he loses the will to fight. Uh, two years later, the two uh, remaining son, uh, brothers, Meredith and uh, Rhys, sack Tenby. And when they're finished sacking Tenby, uh, they, um, they hand it over to William, which is, okay, they're cousins, but there must have been, there must have been something else going on there. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if that had something to do with the fact that uh, Maurice was the steward of St. David's, David was a bishop of St. David's. Maybe there was a truce negotiated. Maybe they were just cousins and they knew they couldn't hold it and they just wanted to um, take their plunder and go. But nevertheless, as, as Melissa pointed out, there were, some things could be very complicated in the, in the march, particularly when you have such close family members uh, working together. And then finally, uh, one of these uh, sons, Maurice in particular, when the opportunities faded in Wales, they became part of the forefront of the uh, conquest of Ireland. Um, the other children nest, Henry Fitzroy, Henry Fitzhenry, excuse me, or sometimes called Henry Fitzroy. He was the son of, uh, he was the son of uh, Henry I, as we already talked about. He was the first, well, he was one of the lords, of, uh, the marcher lord of Narbeth in around 11, 11, 1130, 1135. He, he was also one of the first, he was one of the stewards of uh, the marcher lordship of St. David's. And he died in Anglesey in 1157, supporting the, the Welsh campaign of Henry II. I'm going to go on a little aside here, just very briefly, because there are there are a lot of theories out there, or some theories out there, and I'm beginning to wonder myself that he that the that the affair that Nest had with Henry was not while well, between uh, the marriage to Gerald of Windsor, but may have been after. Because if this were before, he would have been 57 years old when he was on campaign, which is not totally unusual. Uh, the Lord Reese himself was campaigning very late in his life. But also the fact that he came into his lordship so late in 1135, um, when his father had been king. Uh, there, there, there are some things that point that suggest that perhaps 
uh, Ness affair with with Henry may have been a bit later. It may have been after uh, the death. It's 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 an interesting one, but one that we can't really answer. Um, one that we know for sure is that she had a an affair with the sheriff of um, Pembroke. He's actually he's listed in the 1130 uh, pipe roll. Uh, that was Hate. His name was William, and so William fits Hate, and we see him. In the but he is part of a Norman relief force trying to retake Lat Clan Stefan Castle with Maurice uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, he was also marcher lord in his own right of St. Clair's, which was just um, just north of Lawn and 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 uh, west of Carmarthen. And then Robert Fitzstephen, she married at the instigation of her children. She married uh, Ro uh, Stephen, the constable of Cardigan Castle, and they had one son, Robert. Um, he ends up getting captured. In, in, in the Welsh resurgence, held in jail in Kilgarran for a few years. And one of the conditions uh, for his release when Maurice came to uh, organize his release was that he go to Ireland and not return. That was the Lord Reese he was holding him. So Fitz, Robert Fitzstephen, Maurice Fitzgerald, they become two of the leading figures of the spectacularly successful Norman Con early Norman conquest of Ireland. And um, in fact, Fitzgerald is still a name. And in fact, if, if you look it up now, there is the ninth Duke of Leinster, uh, who is alive today, his name is Maurice Fitzgerald. Um, so that, that dynasty has uh, stood for centuries. So Ness legacy, and I've got just a few minutes here. Um, she's thought to have died around 1136. She was certainly uh, extremely fertile and healthy. Uh, her children all grew up to a ripe old age. Um, she was. She will always be remembered as the Helen of Wales. That's that's her. That's her main epitaph. And if you look her up, all the all the fictional stories about her, everything revolves around passion, uh, her beauty. It's clear her beauty led to her abduction and the subsequent political unrest. Um, but one also must remember that she was much more than that. She was a hostage under her Norman captors. Her father was on the run even before the Normans came several times. So she lived in an extremely turbulent time and, and was always on the run and always on the look, uh, look out. She, um, she had a liaison with the future, with the king or the future king of England, which was incredibly important, as I said, an illegitimate son of, um, an illegitimate son of a king or a future king was not as we would think of it today. They, that can bring a lot of wealth and power and their son did have, uh, became a marcher lord in his own right. Uh, her marriage to the castle of Pembroke created a dynasty that dominated Southwest Wales for many years. Like I said, one became a bishop, uh, uh, the Bishop of St. David's, another one, uh, the Lord of Carew, and another one, the, uh, a Lord of Leinster, uh, or Lord of Ireland, excuse me. Um, uh, and then some of her children, uh, as I said, then several of her children, grandchildren formed the nucleus of the Norman conquest of Ireland. And that may be, if any, that may, that may be her longest lasting, lasting legacy. Um, and, 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 well, that's about time up, but uh, now she's an incredibly interesting character. Uh, there are there have been books written about her. There's much speculation, but if if you if you if you try not to look at uh, exactly what may have happened, and you can try and get a picture uh, around this time, it, it's incredibly fascinating. And I, and one that thought did occur to me um, is is I do wonder sometimes if the Welsh would have viewed her could view her as as perhaps having been somewhat a traitor to the cause. I mean. It's it's her it's her um, legitimacy that gives Gerald legitimacy that creates that power base around Pembroke. Uh, I don't think she had much choice to be honest, and 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 she was a, she was uh, and she was obviously a, a pragmatic person uh, and and a survivor. But um, but that there, there's no doubt about it. Without her, I think the history of Southwest Wales would have been uh, com would have been uh, entirely different. There's no doubt about that. Okay, Philip. End of string share. Thanks, John. Well, we uh, we promised some passion. Uh, we promised some passion, and I think I, I think you, you you've delivered that. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, I, I picked the version with the with the with the, the least offensive word in it. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, again a sort of fascinating uh, insight. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a, a thread across all three of the talks this afternoon uh, of the complexities uh, of interrelationships uh, and alliances uh, 
both within within the marches uh, and, and uh, across the marches and uh, and, and into Wales. Um, so that is that is fascinating. Um, I think as at the moment there aren't any questions, um, so people people are probably still um, thinking of them. So if Craig uh, and Melissa uh, could rejoin us. Um, if, if Craig, Melissa, if you could switch on your um, videos, uh, that, good. I, I was just uh, begin, just being to think, Craig, that your sleepless night. <laughs> Craig has a has a baby uh, uh, teething at the moment. Um, <laughs> I've been having various uh, email exchanges with Craig um, when I've sort of um, looked at my watch. And realise that he must be sending them at two a.m. Uh, in the morning in California. In California. <laughs> um, all right. Sorry. There's a question. There is a one second. Just a question just popped up. It's not clear who this is from because it says use six eight one eight eight two R. Do we know where Nest is buried? Um, allegedly at Keru Castle. Um, but, but there's no way to know that. There's all kinds of uh, different theories, but the, the one I saw um, that, uh, because uh, apparently Kairi was, was built uh, initially, not for the sun, but um, was built for Nest by Gerald. So they had their own, they would have their own, uh, they would have their own castle. And, and so that's the theory that she was then uh, buried there. Thanks. Uh, and then there's a lengthy question I'll put to Craig in a second. Um, but then just a couple of quick comments uh, for, for Melissa. Um, this is from John Kenyon, whose name you'll recognize. Um, in terms of your question about the watercolor view of Course Castle, um, John saying he can only suggest Moses Griffith or Paul Sandby, but he'll mm. continue but he'll continue to explore um, yes. because yes, on the internet, there's no artist named. No, that's that's been my problem. I think it's a gorgeous watercolor, of course. Yeah. I, I, I just, well, I'd love to know who did it so I can he, actually cite the he, artist. <laughs> John's added another comment, which of course that's assuming it is coarse and, and, it, and it isn't a wrong attribution. Yeah, it could be Clun, I think, actually looking at the side of it. I don't know. There's there's one that's wrongly attributed to course. It's actually Clun Castle. All right. I don't know whether it's it's meant to be a Shropshire Castle, but I'd right. be yeah. Okay. Well, well John, like it, so. John, John, John's on the task, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll have a look into it. But it, he also John's also just mentioned um, commented on. You mentioned the Lestrange family uh, uh, of Shropshire, and he adds, however, uh, the word that is spelled K N O C K I N is pronounced knocking, knocking, yeah. knocking not yeah, knocking. Okay, right. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and he, he, he hopes that it is still pronounced in the traditional way. Uh, <laughs> So I also stand uh, corrected because, yes, I, I, I have, in my ignorance, uh, pronounced it phonetically. And so, yes, I, I also need to remember that it is, it is knocking. Uh, OK, Craig. Um, I'll so need to read this out. Uh, Alistair Ayton says, thank you very much for a fascinating paper to kick things off today. You said at one point that Gwen Winwen was given permission to make mischief, uh, which uh, Alistair uh, likes very much. And he, he says, apologies if I missed it, but who was it who gave Gwen Winwen license to seize territory not yet in his possession? And if it was the King of England, what do you think this demonstrates in terms of the English crown attempting to extend its influence in Wales? Uh, is this an example of the crown encouraging Gwen Winwen to look westwards to his own benefit and, also, and that of the crown? Yes, uh, so it was, it was John. Uh, John had acceded to the throne in March of 1199 after Richard the Lionheart was killed uh, 
um, in France, as I recall, uh, by an archer uh, using a frying pan as a shield. Uh, just one of those lucky things. He uh, shot either an arrow or a crossbow bolt or something like that at extreme range, and it just happened to deal uh, Richard the Lionheart a fatal wound. Um, so um, it was uh, John, a few months into his uh, into his reign, who, who did that. Uh, um, did it demonstrate, you know, increasing involvement in, in Welsh affairs? Yeah, and certainly not in the case of closely to Richard from, you know, the, the beginning of the 1190s onward demonstrates that. We can go back earlier as well. Uh, but more than that, and I, I, I briefly touched on this, um, there is this, this rather tantalising suggestion that um, the overlordship of powers as a polity was contemplated or was thought of as a possibility by Richard. And we come to that because there's this business of um, uh, a man by, by the name of Aaron was his name, um, being given the sum of 20 pounds to purchase the uh, silver mine at Carrickhofer. And it never got spent, which implies that Owen Cavaliog felt he was uh, obliged to give the silver mine over to Richard because it was his as law dictated. Yeah. The law said that the King of England owns all silver mines in his jurisdiction. So that implies, if it wasn't paid for, that Owain acknowledged that he was within the King of England's jurisdiction. And, you know, it's a little bit stretched to say that that extends to formal overlordship. But the fact that there is no certainty on this point, that money was given and not spent, implies that even there was ambiguity even where, you know, Richard's uh, own administration was concerned. And he wasn't quite sure uh, whether or not um, uh, Owain was under his ages. And of course, in terms of this question, you know, about John uh, and, and the English crown uh, sort of interfering, uh, then of course, you know, at, a, at a similar time, uh, John granted uh, to De Bries uh, that by right of his uh, holding of Radnor uh, to conquer any further lands that he could that he could take uh, in, in Wales. Uh, um, so it, it, it's all at the same time of uh, yes John uh, encouraging uh, people to uh, grab and take what they can. Um, a comment from uh, Patricia um, who's a bit north of you uh, Craig uh, up in uh, Washington uh, on, on, on the northwest uh, coast. Fitzgerald family also went on to become president of the United States. Well, there's also, um, that, that gets mentioned a few times, uh, but then somebody also pointed out, there's probably not many people in Wales that aren't related to Nest in some way, given the amount of children she had. <laughs> um, now, a question from Priscilla. Uh, and she says that she's doing some research on the following. Uh, we have a lot of Norman churches in Wales with Romanesque influence, the Hereford School of Sculpture, for instance. Uh, did this influence come from this family? Uh, it's not clear, Priscilla, which family you're meaning. Uh, and did the Masons use local lads to assist? Please, could you comment? Uh, that, that seems... A, without knowing which family Priscilla you're referring to. That's slightly difficult, I think, for people to, for people to comment. Um, so could you just, do you want to just clarify for us uh, which, which family you're referring to, please? Um, could I just come in here, um, Philip? Yes, David. Well, I, 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 I was, sorry, I was going to suggest, because, uh, you know, if, can I just, um, I think probably what I'll do is draw things to formal conclusion because it's now the finish time, but then people are very welcome to stay and carry on discussing. Um, and I suggest people turn on their videos uh, now, now to do that because um, sort of the issue about broadband, uh, broadband width isn't, doesn't, is less relevant. Um, so the, um, sorry, if I just, so I'll just do, draw things to a formal close and then we'll carry on with discussion because I'm sure some people may want to come, may well want to come back to um, 
some of the questions that Melissa was uh, referring to. So, because I'm conscious also that people are beginning to, to leave us. Um, so huge thanks to uh, Melissa and John. Uh, a fascinating uh, afternoon of talks. Uh, and I'm sure everybody uh, has appreciated that and given us uh, a lot to, to think about. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, our next event uh, is that uh, we've been honoured uh, to, to, to be asked to organise the launch of Craig's new book, um, formally published uh, on Monday uh, and available to be ordered from the University of Hertfordshire Press. Uh, and there is a 20% discount on books uh, purchased from the 14th to the end of March. Uh, and um, the launch, formal sort of online launch uh, of the book will be on Wednesday the 2nd. Um, the Zoom access code for that has been distributed already to uh, Mortimer History Society members um, and will be again and, and distributed wild, wild, wild widely uh, across historical societies uh, throughout Wales uh, and the marches. Uh, our AGM is on the 26th of March and that will be followed uh, uh, by a talk uh, and tour uh, of the medieval history uh, of Webley. Um, and then, whoops, my There we go. Screen just uh, just frozen, uh, and then a conference which was first planned for May 2020, a joint conference with the Radnish Society, titled "Murder, Mayhem, and Marriage." So picking up some of the themes explored today, um, but focusing very much on the relationship between the Mortimers and the Welsh princes. Uh, that conference, which has now been twice. Uh, cancelled, postponed because of COVID. We are now extremely uh, hopeful, confident that it will finally be able to take place uh, at Knighton on the 14th of May. Um, so we will be putting out uh, publicity uh, soon uh, for people to be able to book their places at that. Okay, so that's the sort of formal uh, bits done and we can carry on chatting. So sorry, David, I, in I interrupted you. Oh, no problem. No, no problem. Um, just just um, a couple of points. First of all, on the, uh, on the on the issue of the Romanesque influence in Welsh churches, uh, I, I wouldn't actually think that there's much hope of pinning it on a particular family in that it is so widespread, you know, from the march uh, right over to Anglesey um, you know, we have very, very strong Romanesque influences and they are to be, uh, they're, they're really to be sketched in terms of, for example, contacts with continental Europe. Um, we can also find uh, that there are, I think, distinct avenues by which uh, a, what I'll call a Roman <laughs> penetration of Wales takes place. So there are um, there are all sorts of ways in, in which the Romanesque influence comes in. Um, that mu rather more important than that, that's just a glancing comment, but rather more important than that um, is we've, we've met this afternoon with some uh, of the issues when we get different accounts, for example, or, or variants in the chronicles. And there I think it is absolutely essential to remember that the chronicles as we have them are, of course, in Welsh. Uh, and, and I mean the Britiae. And I also include in that Brynhyn uh, Nether Saison. Um, those chronicles were originally written in Latin. And we have a fragment, a very close fragment, uh, in, in, the, in the chronicle that we know as Chronica Dualia. Dualia. Uh, now we call it not Chronica, but Chronicon Dualia, as a result of some very clever uh, paleography um, by Georgia Henley. Um, the, the, the problem here is that not only do we have transmission into Welsh from a largely lost Latin source or sources, 
we are still arguing, those of us who are foolish enough to waste some of our time looking at Welsh chronicles, we have to recall that um, we, we, are, we are dealing with um, not only different translations, two of them, the Britiaid, the Peniath 20 and the Red Book versions are very similar. Uh, the Saison appears to be what I'll call a little more wayward. It can come up with some very interesting take on issues, but quite often it looks like the poor relation in terms of accuracy of copying. We, so we've got copying from sources that are largely lost. We've got uh, those sources that themselves may have been subject to early dispersal fragmentation, because it's clear that in some instances, chroniclers are moving about. Uh, and as they move about, then they, they kind of shed material, if, if you like, there's different versions that crop up. And that is particularly the case in some parts of the 12th century in particular. It's also the case in the mid 13th, um, but, but there we're dealing with a chronicle written originally and maintained in Latin. Um, we've got the further issue that when translations are taking place from Latin into Welsh, um, they're taking place in different areas uh, so that uh, the, the, the links, the principal links, for example, with Brenhine as a Saison would appear to be southern ones. I'm looking at Neath and just conceivably elements of contact with Whitland, whereas uh, in the mainstream of the Britiae, we're, we're looking at, um, well, some influence maybe involving Neath but principally we're looking at Strata Florida and Valley Crucis. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we've, we've got such chaos in the development of the Chronicles that it's actually, it's amazing that by and large, they tell the same story rather than surprising that sometimes they don't. <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I just want to make the, the important point that there's an awful lot, when, when, we, when we make these references, we make a reference to the Chronicle, well, that's very easy to do. They've been beautifully edited and they've been well printed, uh, you know, and, and they're there and we can easily refer to them. But when we do so, we should remember that we've got to take a few months out to just check the avenues and the axes of transmission. And that's something that, you know, is, is getting done, but it takes a very long time. But the, the, the recent volume um, on, I'm just reading the title, I shouldn't, I was one of the contributors, but it's the Chronicles of Medieval Wales and the March. Um, and uh, that was uh, published by Brepols, and uh, it's organised under the aegis, really, of the Welsh Chron Chronicles Research Group, located principally in, in Bangor. Um, that's a, an invaluable starting point. And then we've got to move on under our own steam because there's thank an awful lot of work still to be done. That's, yes, I just wanted to that point. Uh, thank you. I, I have been writing stories for children. And um, so we're talking about it at a very sort of lowly level. But I'm intrigued whether youngsters, probably boys, got involved with the carving um, under the, the Masons, presumably Norman or French, coming from abroad, uh, a place like Kilpeck. I'm quite, I live quite close to Kilpeg. Um, and, uh, you know, I want, because I want to introduce the children into this, presumably boys only, <laughs> um, as to how, how they might have got involved if they did. But we probably don't know anything. It probably all has to be imagination. Uh, if, if I can respond to that very briefly. Please do. Um, for, the first thing I would say is that we, we regard people, for example, of 14 as being children for the most part. I realize in, in, in Wales, in Wales, if you're 14, you're a man. That, yes, that's, I that's, the, that's the point at which manhood comes. And yeah. therefore, in a sense, we do have to look at um, people we would regard them as very young, but, but they're, they're regarded as you know, sort of fully functioning adults. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and, and there, also, there is also the point that we do have very, very strong elements of uh, family continuity particularly in what I'll call the, the sort of quasi-professional classes, 
um, and, and I'm talking about poets, I'm talking about medics as well, um, and there, and, and pre presumably lawyers, um, and there you get people clearly being brought up to follow uh, a sort of parental profession or a uh, parental tradition, and they must have been imbibing stuff from a very, very young age. Yes. That they're, you know, by the time they reach 14 and they start what is probably a formal apprenticeship of some sort, yes, it they're, already, they're already steeped in it. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn my nose up, certainly, at the idea that um, younger members of families involved in such, such a thing as you know, sculptural presentation were, were very young indeed and just keeping an eye on things, just being exposed to those sorts of developments, whether they'd be trusted with a chisel is another matter, <laughs> but, um, partic mm. particularly, particularly a Romanesque chisel, because they yes. were special. But there I, we are, sorry. Are you, are, are you, are you familiar, uh, ha, have you read Malcolm Furby's books uh, on the Herefordshire School? Um, I have just got one now. Because it, Ma Malcolm Felby is the person who's done, um, you know, sort of I mean, the most work uh, on yes. the uh, Her Herefordshire School. Um, yes, I've got it next door, actually. Right. Yes, I have. Yes, because I mean, of course, the um, I mean, you know, an important thing to bear in mind um, is that the actual sculptors who were, and of course, you know, the school um, is is a slightly misleading uh, phrase. Mm. Uh, because they will just have been a group uh, of, of masons mm. um, mm. And, and as David said that you know, tra tra you know, with their own apprentices and training um, but of course they, they themselves were unlikely to have been Norman uh, they, they, were, they, they will have been uh, engaged by and uh, Norman lords would have been their patrons yes uh, but they, they, were, they were the, the, the sculptors and the masons of the Herefordshire School uh, will, will have been local people. Um, and so where did they get the, the Romanesque style? Before? Well, well if, you, if you read, I'm not an expert, but if you read Malcolm Furby, yes. what you begin to what you begin to realise is the extent to which um, the in, uh, ideas and influences were being transmitted all across Europe. Um, yes. So you know. They, the, the experts can see influences from France, from Spain, from Italy, from Rome, uh, as well as Celtic influences and Anglo-Saxon influences. Yes. Um, so it, it was it was a ferment of cross fertilization uh, of ideas uh, and, and creativity uh, yes. coming from all over. Thank um, you. And again, Thanks. one of the things that Malcolm does really very well is to you know, through analysis of the carvings, show um, which were being done by um, the master craftsman uh, and which were being done uh, by the apprentices. Um, so you know, Malcolm would say that the, uh, for example, the font in Alton Church um, near me, um, you know, it's sort of it's fairly crude in its carving, and he would put that down to apprentices. Whereas the Tampanum, uh, the church at Pipaston, uh, he he would argue is done by one of the master craftsmen, who in fact he calls uh, the uh, As the Aston ma master. Yes. Um, well, I'm just sort of checking the messages list. Um, just before we leave that point, can I add this? Yeah. It's. Oh, uh, it's somewhat related. That's the best I can say. But um, I, uh, I've just spent the last two minutes looking at my hard drive and Googling. I can't find it for the life of me. And somebody in the room will put me right. I recall reading a paper some time ago, and I want to say it was written by Chris Capel, who's done such splendid work about Drislin and uh, Dinevod castles. And uh, it was, if I remember rightly, uh, the discovery of Mason's marks uh, on uh, stonework um, you know, that was uncovered during the excavations there. Yes. I think, and I think it was Nevern. But if you're looking for, like, you know, uh, influence of, of, not vernacular influence, but, you know, the influence of the, the evidence of, of the people who were working the stone, 
who were not necessarily master, you know, masons and such, then that might be something that, hmm. as I said, it's not church architect, architect, architecture yes. that we're talking about. But I believe that was Chris Capel. I believe the castle was never. Yes, because yes, because yes, they, 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 you know, they, 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 they were you know, hired uh, to by 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 whoever. Um, oh, Melissa has sent a message to say that her um, Zoom has frozen uh, and she's had to uh, disappear uh, and she'll try to rejoin us if she can. Thank you very much anyway. It's, okay. interesting. it's a pleasure. Thank you, for, thank you for being with us. Um, <laughs> are there any other questions? I mean, people, as I said, pe people are welcome to turn on their videos uh, and unmute yourselves now if you want to ask any questions uh, directly uh, to, to the speakers. Uh, or indeed, although Melissa still hasn't been able to rejoin us, respond to any of the questions that Melissa posed to us. Craig. The apotropaic symbol threshold to Nevern Castle. Excavations in the summer of 12, uh, 2011 at Nevern Castle revealed the new southern entrance to the castle constructed of May claw clay mortared slate in the final quarter of the 12th century. The threshold was formed of vertically seated slates imitating the natural bedrock. 13 of these slates had designs inscribed into one or both faces. Their location, the absence of such inscribed slates from the rest of the site, and the nature of the symbols, which could not normally be seen, suggest they were apotropaic in nature. This paper presents record and interpretation of this unusual in situ apotropaic symbol threshold deposit. So I misremembered somewhat, um, but there it is for what it's worth. You can find it on Durham's website. Uh, it's one of Chris Cable's outputs. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Uh, right. Uh, Andy has just uh, asked a question, um, for, but it's for, for, for Melissa. Um, <laughs> Andy, do you want to just turn your video on? Because um, it might be that uh, somebody else might be able to uh, answer your question. So is that, yeah, is that, am, I, am I there? Yeah, well, you, we can see your chin, Andy. Oh dear, uh, so I can't Beard. see the uh, camera. Let's see, uh, is that any better? Well, bend, just bend down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you wanted to ask about Margaret yeah. Corbett's land? What it, what it was, I just um, wondered whether uh, the uh, dispute over Margaret Corbett's lands was uh, related to uh, the precise uh, law under which they were held, and whether the question was whether they counted as now a land under uh, Welsh law, and whether that was at the base of the... Um, as to whether they should revert to the uh, original family or stay with the uh, new family, if you get there. Uh, yeah, Craig, do you, can, are you able to uh, comment on that or David? Uh, I, I'll defer to David on that. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just about to defer to you, Craig. <laughs> 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 um, um, no, I, I, because I don't think that I don't think we know the the issue in that sort of detail, frank, frankly. Um, it, it really does strike me that, uh, for example, the issue of Welsh law with regard to uh, Margaret Corbett's interest doesn't arise as far as we know. Mm. I mean, that, that's an argument from silence and, and therefore extremely dodgy, but nevertheless, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think we've got the material on which to really comment effectively. I'm sorry. Mm. I thought that might be the case. <laughs> well, at, at least that got us out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> for now, David, for now. <laughs> <laughs> John, don't you get any fancy ideas? No, no I'm not. I'm, I'm staying very quiet. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think that's probably uh, a good stage to uh, draw to draw the afternoon to a conclusion. Um, <laughs> and understandably, uh, sort of the people with us are gradually uh, dwindling anyway. Um, so just to 
repeat my thanks to John, uh, Craig uh, and, and Melissa, uh, who doesn't look as though she's been able to uh, rejoin us. Uh, but thanks very much. Uh, it's been a fascinating, thought provoking uh, afternoon. Um, and so thanks very much indeed. And if you've been looking at the uh, chat uh, comments that have been coming in, quite a number of people have, uh, have just left messages on chat uh, saying how much they've enjoyed the afternoon uh, and appreciated the talks. So many thanks.